um, that's been brewing tonight. So for weeks, as you know, the January 6th committee has been holding hearings. They've been widely covered on the other channels. We haven't seen the news value in them. But there is a bit of news to emerge from that story, and we want to get to it now. So the New York Times has written hundreds and hundreds of articles about January 6th since it happened, describing it as a riot, an insurrection. As part of its coverage last summer, the Times published a video documentary in which the Times reported that one man was actually caught on camera planning an insurrection, encouraging a breach of the Capitol complex. That man's name is Ray Epps. Now, the New York Times noted that Epps was videotaped on both January 5th and January 6th, urging protesters to storm the Capitol. Here it is. We need to go in to the Capitol. Let's go! So I'm going to put it out there. I'm probably going to go to jail tomorrow. We need to go into the Capitol. Into the Capitol. What? Now, in a lot of ways, that's the strangest video to emerge from January 6th. We played it several times in this show. Quote, we need to go into the Capitol, into the Capitol, Ray Epps tells the crowd. He says it repeatedly. He's so emphatic about it, encouraging other people to commit a crime, that the crowd around him decides he must be a federal agent. They began chanting, as you just heard, Fed, Fed. So shortly after that video surfaced, the FBI placed Ray Epps on a list of people wanted for questioning, and they released it to the public. And you can understand why they did that. According to the Justice Department, what Ray Epps did on that video is a federal crime. Okay, Tucker, that's quite enough of that. Uh, Fox News wanted me to let you know you're fired. <laughs> uh, but uh, you are now here on the Hoplite channel. And we are here to discuss the worst day in American history. Am I talking about 9-11? Not quite. Pearl Harbor, not even close. The final episode of The Sopranos. Uh, Arguably an awful day, but no, we are here to talk about three years gone, one year away, January 6, 2021. That's right. Um, it's the third anniversary of Insurrection Day or American Bastille Day, if uh, you're not into the whole brevity thing. Yeah, uh, a lot of things in the news today because it's the third anniversary and we are approximately... Uh, with a few hours uh, in difference, one year away from the next uh, vote certification uh, for who will be our president in the United States for the next four years. Uh, it'll be on January 6, 2025. Um, yeah, today is Saturday, January 6 of 2024. And we're going to discuss um, the day itself and uh, strange things that have happened since and what this could all possibly mean as to uh, what the future of the country will look like uh, going forward and how I don't think uh, it's very positive at all. It's, it has all the hallmarks of a country in decline uh, operating like a banana republic would. And I hate saying that because I'm an American and I never thought I would live to see this day come, but I think we are here. Um, so let's, uh, let's talk about, uh, a news story that came out, um, uh, a while, well, about two months ago now, but, um, we'll discuss how this story, um, essentially confirms a lot of people's suspicions, uh, about, uh, the 2020 election and January 6th itself. Before we do. Let's, uh, let's get an overview of what happened on, you know, January 6th itself. So we see that uh, uh, there was a, quote-unquote, um, mass movement of people, uh, Trump voters, uh, angry people uh, that uh, believe that the 2020 election um, was stolen from them. And um, I don't know where they got that idea because it's not like five swing states needed more than a day to count their election totals. It's not like Joe Biden got 81 million votes, um, the most of any president in U.S. history, uh, despite the fact that um, he hardly campaigned. So yeah, they, they marched on the Capitol, people entered the Capitol, and uh, a big uh, hullabaloo uh, took, took place. 
Uh, but we know there were zero police casualties. No police, firefighters, or uh, paramedics uh, died on January 6th. Uh, none of them died uh, as a consequence of injuries suffered that day. We do know uh, there was one hostile casualty among the, um, the MAGA uh, voters, and that was, as I mentioned in my last episode, Ashley Babbitt. Um, she was shot in the neck by a Capitol Police officer as she was jumping or trying to jump over a barricade. Uh, she was completely unarmed, by the way, and she died uh, from her gunshot wound uh, on that day, and it's, it's tragic. And, the, of course, the Capitol Police officer was not charged with any crime whatsoever for shooting uh, an armed woman. Um, property damage. Most likely thousands of dollars of property damage. Furniture, windows, etc. cetera. Um, you know, but cleaning up afterwards. Uh, by government math, they'd probably tell you, you know, $73 billion worth of damage was done. But by actual math, like probably thousands of dollars, less than $100,000. Elections that were secured won, right? So despite the insurrection happening, uh, it held up Congress for about five, six hours, and they still voted to cer certify the contested 2020 election. And uh, Joe Biden has been uh, the president uh, since that day. Uh, what happened in the aftermath? Um, well, the uh, federal agencies, uh, most, um, most uh prolific was the FBI went on a uh, rampage uh, arresting people who were at the uh, January 6th protest or possibly um, helped uh, foment the plot to uh, insurrect the government. 1,100 people have since been arrested and many have been sentenced to jail terms um, in excess of 10 years for what, as I said, resulted in no police casualties, thousands of dollars in property damage, and no election stolen or even held up for longer than a couple hours. Um, FBI agents and informants who took part in January 6th, unknown. Uh, the FBI refuses to answer the question. They won't say yes and they won't say no. If you were a betting person, you would say that if a federal agency refuses to tell you whether or not they had informants, as in a without a doubt quick no, we did not, then you can probably assume the answer is yes. So what has this done uh, for Americans overall uh, as it pertains to their trust in their government and free and fair elections, and it's at an all-time low. And um, that's for very good reason. Like I said, uh, the 2020 election, uh, if you've been alive for any amount of time and voted in state, local, or uh, federal elections, you know it usually works like this. Everybody's told, like, November's coming up, get out and vote. You show your ID, or at least you should. You vote, you go home after work, or if, or if you voted after work, you fix dinner, and then you sit down and watch the news as the returns come in. And before you go to bed, they call the election for whoever won because the votes have been counted. Uh, 2020 was the first time in modern history where that didn't happen. And it was only, I believe, five or six swing states uh, five states that uh, didn't know who won their election. Ohio and Florida both called their elections for Donald Trump. He won both of those states in 2016. But Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, uh, Georgia, and Arizona, I believe, somehow didn't quite know who won their elections. And they needed more than a few days to count to count all the votes and find out who won. And wouldn't you know it, every single state that needed more time flipped back to Joe Biden, who, as I said, in 1988, had to uh, drop out of uh, the election for that year that he was running in uh, because his poll numbers were so low. Three months into the, his campaign, he had to drop out. So he said, well, I'll just wait 32 years and run again, and I'll uh, take America by storm and win 81 million votes. Uh, that's what we were told, that's how it went down, and if you believe otherwise, uh, you might be an insurrectionist. But uh, speaking of FBI agents and informants that possibly took part in uh, January 6th, uh, let's jump to that story I just mentioned, and um, maybe this will shed some light on uh, what happened that day three years ago. Uh, from NBC News, and it says, 
Prosecutors seek six-month sentence for Jan 6 defendant targeted by far-right conspiracy theorists. Ray Epps, a Donald Trump supporter whom conspiracy theorists accuse of being a federal operative, pleaded guilty to a misdemeanor and is set to be sentenced next week by Ryan J. Riley. And this was January 2nd of uh, this year. Federal prosecutors are seeking a six-month pr prison sentence for a Donald Trump supporter and Jan 6 defendant who became the focus of conspiracy theories promoted on far-right and members of Congress. Ray Epps, who's scheduled to be sentenced next week, pleaded guilty to a misdemeanor charge in September. Sentencing guidelines for this crime range from zero to six months. In a sentencing memo filed Tuesday, prosecutors wrote that a six-month sentence is justified because of Epps' alleged efforts to inspire and gather a crowd to storm the Capitol and overwhelm police at a key breach point. Video from Jan 6 of 21 shows Epps holding a large metal frame Trump sign that rioters jammed in the police line. A federal judge acquitted another Jan 6 participant who had his hand on the sign saying his intention was unclear. In the sentencing memo, prosecutors described Epps as a unique case in the context of the January 6 defendants. After he turned himself into the FBI shortly two days after the riot and cooperated with a series of voluntary interviews, he also tried to de-escalate tensions between law enforcement and rioters during the attack on the Capitol. Prosecutors know that Epps was targeted by far-right conspiracy theory that falsely suggested he was an undercover government agent during the riot after his image was added to and then removed from the FBI's Capitol Violence website. Other than his four years in the Marines, Epps has never been a federal agent, prosecutors wrote, adding the fallout from the conspiracy theories forced Epps to sell his business, move to a different state, and live reclusively. Nevertheless, the mitigation value of these harms must be contextualized. Many January 6 defendants have suffered adverse ancillary consequences in their lives due to their participation in the riot, they wrote. Sentencing courts in this district have generally rejected arguments that such defendants have already been punished enough by society for their actions on January 6. Epps filed a defamation suit against Fox News this year, alleging that the network and former host Tucker Carlson made Epps the central figure in a lie they concocted about January 6, 2021, and destroyed his reputation and livelihood by repeating false claims about him. Fox News has sought to dismiss the lawsuit. Prosecutors said in their sentencing memo that as he was targeted by the far right, Epps attributed the violence that ensued during the riot to Antifa. Ironically, given the conspiracy theory surrounding him, Epps repeatedly attributed the violence that occurred on January 6th to undercover members of Antifa posing as Trump supporters and inciting others to hijack a righteous, peaceful protest. They wrote, citing Epps' interview with the former House January 6th committee, an attorney for Epps did not immediately respond to a request for comment on the sentencing memo Tuesday. Far-right members of the House have raised questions about Epps, as has Republican Senator Ted Cruz of Texas, a Harvard Law graduate, who previously was an Associate Deputy Attorney General in the Justice Department. Cruz pressed an FBI official about Epps at a 2022 Senate hearing in a line of questioning just a week after Cruz appeared on Carlson's show to apologize for using the word terrorist to describe criminals who violently committed politically motivated assaults on law enforcement officers. Who is Ray Epps, by the way, since you are a senator, Carlson asked Cruz during the 2020 appearance. Several days later, Cruz posed the same question to the FBI official at the Senate hearing. Who is Ray Epps, Cruz asked. Yeah. Who is Ray Epps, right? We still don't really know. Um, and Cruz never got a answer to that question that he posed to an FBI official who is a servant of the government and who should be compelled to answer these questions and should not be able to hold their positions in law enforcement if they fail to answer a direct question to a senator. Who is Ray Epps? Does he work for you? Has he ever worked for you? Was he there on January 6th as an informant? If you can't answer that, then you should be out of a job. And that's exactly what the FBI did. They just said, well, we don't have to tell you. I can't answer that, or I won't answer that. Either way, you're not getting an answer. Um, and now, uh, prosecutors are recommending a six-month sentence for this guy. And um, my question is, uh, what uh, what's happening to other January 6th rioters, uh, uh, insurrectionists, uh, as they're called in the media? Well, let's read an article from The Hill that came out literally yesterday uh, in regards to that. January 6 rioters who were passive but can be convicted of disorderly conduct court rules. Rioters who were passive during the Jan 6, 2021 attack at the Capitol but can be convicted of disorderly conduct a federal court ruled Friday. The case focused on a rioter, Russell Alford, who received a year-long sentence for his role in the insurrection. 
He was attempting to challenge the reasonableness of his sentence and the sufficiency of the evidence to support two of his convictions, both of which are charged him with engaging in disorderly or disruptive conduct. The trial evidence indicated that during Alfred's brief time within the Capitol, he was neither violent nor destructive. D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals Judge Karen LaCraft Henderson wrote in a Friday ruling, Judge Karen, Nevertheless, we affirm his convictions because a jury could rationally find that his unauthorized presence in the Capitol as part of an unruly mob contributed to the disruption of Congress's electoral certification and jeopardized public safety. The ruling came down a day before the third anniversary of the Capitol riot. Over 1,200 people have faced federal crime charges over the insurrection. It is equally clear from case law that even passive, quiet, and nonviolent conduct can be disorderly, the Friday ruling read. Prosecutors are still on the hunt for a minimum of 80 suspects, and whoever placed pipe bombs at the offices of the DNC and Republican National Committees, the FBI has put about $500,000 reward for the perpetrator. We cannot replace votes and deliberation with violence and intimidation, the U.S. Attorneys for D.C., Matthew Graves said in a statement on Thursday. In his first campaign speech of the year Friday, President Biden highlighted the Jan 6 attack in an attempt to cement a point about former President Trump and other Republicans espousing a kind of extremism that is seen by the world on that day. Democracy is on the ballot. Your freedom is on the ballot, Biden said in the speech given near Valley Forge, Pennsylvania. Okay. Um, yeah, so guess what? If you were present on January 6th and you were a passive uh participant as in you just like walked behind people and walked into the Capitol, looked around, maybe took a few selfies with your bros and took a picture of the rotunda and then walked out. Um, guess what? You were part of that insurrection, according to this federal judge on, on uh, Friday. And um, this guy, Alfred, uh, was just one of those people. And it sounds like he's going to get a year long sentence, which is double the sentence being sought for Ray Epps, who is suing Fox News for alleging he was a uh, FBI informant or, or CI, confidential informant, an asset. Yeah, yeah. Russell Alford literally walked in the Capitol and walked back out and faces a year in jail. Ray Epps, who you saw in that first fo uh, video with Tucker Carlson on Fox News, probably the video that a lot of people think got Tucker uh, canned at Fox, he's telling people we need to go into the Capitol. We need to go to the Capitol and then go in multiple times, telling people we should go to the Capitol and enter it and disrupt. This Russell Alford guy was just some dude who was caught up in the crowd, literally did nothing but walk in and walk out, and he's facing a year. But federal prosecutors say, well, you know, Epps, uh, he surrendered himself two days later, really quick, right? Almost like he uh, uh, expected to uh, surrender himself. And uh, well, since he cooperated, we're gonna uh, slap him with a six month misdemeanor. But not for Mr. Alford, yeah. So uh, this should put up, you know, red flags. Alarm bells should go off. This, this, is, uh, this is looking more and more like it was a, a setup. Um, let's continue um, to uh, a second case. Because some of you might be watching and be like, yeah, Hoplite, you know what? You're just uh, one of those Q-tards. You believe in every conspiracy theory that comes down the pike. And, uh, you know, why would the FBI do all this? You know, uh, Joe Biden won the election fair and square, and these people were just upset about it, and the FBI was just doing their job, right? Um, hold that thought. Another article. Same year, 2020. From the Chicago Sun-Times. FBI's tactics doomed case against men charged in kidnapping plot of Michigan governor. The appearance of entrapment and the difficulty of distinguishing between fantasy and criminal conspiracy explains the embarrassing outcome of the federal trial in which jurors acquitted two alleged conspirators and failed to reach verdicts for the other two. This is April 13th of 2022. Through confidential sources, undercover agents, and clandestine recordings, the Justice Department announced in October 2020, law enforcement learned particular individuals were planning to kidnap Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer and acting in furtherance of that plan. But it turned out those individuals included the government's quote-unquote confidential sources who pushed the half-baked scheme and orchestrated acts in furtherance of that plan, even when the defendants resisted it. The appearance of entrapment, coupled with the difficulty of distinguishing between fantasy and criminal conspiracy, 
explains the embarrassing outcome of a federal trial that last, ended last week when jurors acquitted two alleged conspirators and failed to reach verdicts with other two. It was a well-deserved rebuke of investigative methods that crossed the line between prevention and invention. Two of the six original defendants, Ty Garbin and Caleb Franks, pleaded guilty and testified for the prosecution, saying they'll willingly participate in the kidnapping plot. But the record compiled by the government shows FBI agents and their informants were determined to advance a narrative that would justify their efforts. The jurors clearly were troubled by the evidence. They acquitted two of the remaining defendants, Daniel Harris and Brandon Caserta, of conspiring to kidnap Whitner and could not agree on the charges against the other two, Adam Fox and Barry Croft. Prosecutors said the defendants, whom they described them as members of right-wing militias, were so enraged by Whitner's heavy-handed COVID-19 control measures and they resolved to kidnap her. But it was doubtful that they had the ability to mount such an operation, unclear what the upshot was supposed to be. In September of 2020, text message to Daniel Chappell, a key FBI informant who was paid more than 50 grand for his work, Special Agent Jason Chambers said, mission is to kill the governor specifically. But Garbin testified that there were talks of stranding Whitmer in Lake Michigan on a boat without a motor, which would somehow prevent Joe Biden from winning the presidential election. The government portrayed Fox, who was commonly dismissed as an indecisive, incompetent, unserious stoner, as the ringleader. Yet Fox repeatedly talked about abandoning or indefinitely delaying the kidnap scheme. And even when he discussed the logistics, it was clear he had no realistic plan. He imagined using boats and a helicopter, for instance, even though he had access to neither. Several elements of the plot described by the Justice Department seem to be products of government instigation. During a June 2020 meeting highlighted by the FBI, for example, it was an informant who argued that kidnapping was necessary. When Fox reported that militia members could not agree on a plan to kidnap Whitmer or suggested that the idea should be put on the back burner, Chappell continued to promote the scheme. He and other informants also suggested alternative crimes such as firing rounds into Whitmer's vacation cottage and destroying her boat. The informants encouraged, coordinated, assisted, or funded various acts that the government cited as evidence of the conspiracy, including the use of encrypted communications, a nighttime drive to Whitmer's cottage that went awry because the FBI gave the wrong address and several field training exercises or FTXs. Although the FBI suggested that abbreviation was familiar to the defendants, Caserta had to ask Chapel what it meant. The FBI said its informants operated independently unaware of each other's identities, but audio recordings show they colluded to produce the evidence the FBI wanted. I'm not going to induce any effing illegal activity that we don't have to, one declared. These FBI tactics are familiar from early investigations. In many terrorism cases, the agency likewise used informal informants to implicate suspects in crimes they otherwise might not have had the inclination or wherewithal to commit. We have a saying in my office, Special Agent Henrik Impola told a confidential informant after the kidnapping suspects were arrested, don't let the facts get in the way of a good story. Well, that's a good one, Henrik. I'm sure that's what the saying is. So there you have that. Uh, in, in January, uh, well, no, this was back in June of 2020, you have the FBI trying to set up members of this Michigan militia to... Uh, to instigate a kidnapping plot that looks to be almost entirely FBI concocted and uh, promoted by their informants. It's almost like that, that meme, you know, come on, do, do crime, do terrorism, like do something. So this is where the FBI crossed over into entrapment. And yet you have something happening in January of 2021 on the 6th and a guy named Ray Epps is hell-bent on telling everybody to go into the Capitol, right? Peacefully, right? Peacefully. Just remember that. But go into the Capitol. As in like, you should really cross the threshold from outside, which is where the public's allowed to be, to inside where we're normally not. We need to go in. That's the most important part is just go in. Um, yeah. Yeah. And Ray Epps is going to get six months if prosecutors get their way. So um, let's read uh, from the DOJ's own website what the elements of entrapment are and see if we can like, you know, make sense of these two, uh, these two capers, right? The, 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 the Governor Whitmer kidnapping plot and the January 6th insurrection plot. So from the DOJ, this is... Uh, CRM 500 to 999 section 
uh, section in particular is 645, Entrapment Elements. And it says, Entrapment is a complete defense to a criminal charge on the theory that government agents may not originate a criminal design, implant in an innocent person's mind the disposition to commit a criminal act, and then induce commission of the crime so the government may prosecute. Jacobson versus the United States. A valid entrapment defense has two related elements. One, government inducement of the crime, and two, defendant's lack of predisposition to engage in the criminal conduct. Matthews versus U.S. Of the two elements, predisposition is by far the more important. Inducement is the threshold issue in the entrapment defense. Mere solicitation to commit a crime is not inducement. Soros versus U.S. Nor does the government's use of artifice, stratagem, pretense, or deceit establish inducement. Rather, inducement requires a showing of at least persuasion or mild coercion. U.S. versus Nations. Pleas based on need, sympathy, or friendship, or extraordinary promises of the sort that would blind the ordinary person to his legal duties. U.S. versus Evans. Inducement shown only if government's behavior was such that a law-abiding citizen will, to obey the law could have been overborne. Even if inducement has been shown, a finding of predisposition is fatal to an entrapment defense. The predisposition inquiry focuses upon whether the defendant was an unwary innocent or instead an unwary criminal who readily availed himself of the opportunity to perpetrate the crime. Thus, predisposition should not be confused with intent or mens rea, a guilty mind. A person may have the requisite intent to commit the crime, yet be entrapped. Also, predisposition may exist even in the absence of prior criminal involvement. The ready commission of the criminal act, such as where a defendant promptly accepts an undercover agent's offer of an opportunity to buy or sell drugs, may itself establish predisposition. Okay, so what that's basically saying is that there's a fine line that law enforcement can cross where you have a sting operation and then you have an entrapment scam. And you can usually see these things for what they are just going down the facts, right? Um, the facts of the Governor Whitmer plot. It's like, okay, FBI agents and FBI informants, I think, outnumbered the... Um, uh, the criminals they were quote unquote going after. Um, they said that the uh, informants kept suggesting new crimes and kept pushing the uh, targets of the investigation to go out and actually follow through with uh, what they were planning. It sounds like literally none of the guys they were investigating had any designs of actually following through with this idea, but they kept on being given you know, incentive or encouragement to do it. That's entrapment, right? It's one thing for me to park my police car um, and wait for you to come by with my radar gun and catch you speeding. The speed limit is posted. You know what the speed limit is, but um, you know you break the law anyway, and I catch you in, in the uh, in the process. And I hid, right? I deceived you. I hid behind some trees so you couldn't see my cop car. If you had known I was there, you probably would have slowed down and, you know, obeyed the speed limit, but you didn't. Now let's say this. Let's say uh, I parked my police car behind uh, a stack of trees, and then I go up to the sign and I replace it, you know, with a different sign that says, um, you know, um, road work, right? Um, so you see a road work sign and you're driving and you break the speed limit and I get you for a second ticket for the road work. It's like, well, I created the conditions that enhanced your crime, even though no such, you would not have sped through a road, a road uh, work sign had you known that it would increase your chances of getting a, a higher fine, which is why they say when you go uh, by road work signs, it says, you know, uh, speeding fines are doubled. Um, you cannot create new conditions for what otherwise would have been one crime. It's the same as uh, a, a cop trying to sell you drugs, but then when you show like hesitance, he sweetens the deal and says, I'll tell you what, um, if you don't want to buy from me today, um, I'll cut you a deal and I'll give you a two for one. Meaning um, if you buy this, you know, three grams of cocaine, I'll throw in uh, three for free. And the person's, you know, a drug addict, they're like, oh, well, that's a really good deal. You know, I wasn't really going to buy because I don't really have the money right now. But, you know, two for one, like, I, I, how do I say no to that? 
and then you charge the guy with buying six grams of you know cocaine versus the two you originally were going to sell him. Um, there are things you can do to induce someone to commit a crime when they first show reluctancy or, or just flat out don't want to. You can create the conditions for a crime. As I said, I'm at a speed limit sign. I catch you uh, speeding and I, and I got you in the radar gun because uh, I was hiding. Um, but then I put up a road work sign to enhance the charge where there's no such road work going on. Um, th this is entrapment. Um, people have to know within reason what they're going into and they have to voluntarily choose to break the law. If you give them incentives and induce them to break said law, that's not legal and that's a complete defense. So you got to ask yourself, if Ray Epps was just some guy, a Trump supporter who thought Antifa were the bad guys, why was he telling all of the people around him that we need to go into the Capitol? Why was he so insistent upon that, right? It wasn't enough for him to lead a group of people to the Capitol. He was suggesting, or more or less saying, we need to go in. Uh, regular people don't do that. Like, that doesn't make any sense. Uh, and he never explained why. Well, why did you say we have to go in? Like, what, what was your rationale for that? Um, and this is what's going on now in America is that they're seeing this guy who turned himself in two days after, you know, the insurrection, but they're not sentencing him until next week, three years later. Oh, and by the way, if you know the, the guys who placed pipe bombs at the RNC and the DNC, please be sure to reach out to the FBI because it's been three years now and they don't know who those people were. It's 500 grand or 50, yeah, 500 grand in it for you, I think, if you know. Uh, but the Bureau, yeah, um, try as they might, they can't track down uh, actual terrorists who put pipe bombs in offices, right? Maybe that story was also concocted and made up and... Uh, those pipe bombs never existed or, or somebody who worked for the FBI as an informant um, put them there and, and that that just became a news story. Uh, they haven't found those people yet though, but 1,100 people uh, who were passive bystanders or who went into the Capitol and pushed and shoved uh, and maybe pushed their way past a couple Capitol police officers, uh, they're getting uh, decades uh, in prison. And this guy, Ray Epps, who was the face of the quote-unquote insurrection, uh, is getting a six-month misdemeanor recommendation. Uh, yeah, that's just, uh, that's just not believable. Um, and this is why I want to do this episode, is that I said in the, in the initial part uh, opening that United States, as it you know, continues in this evolution of where our country's going. Joe Biden says, you know, democracy is on the ballot. Like, that means anything anymore. It's like, yeah, democracy is on the ballot, but uh, there are certain states that are trying to get Donald Trump kicked off uh, because, well, democracy is on the ballot, but, you know, your choices will be limited in that democracy. But it, don't worry, it's still democracy. Um, when people no longer trust their government or their elections, um, that's the road to uh, civil conflict and civil war. Uh, to f put fuel on that fire uh, is to weaponize the police forces where they are uh, basically political suppression components of the, of the government. Um, you have notorious uh, police agencies from history that did just this. The Gestapo, the KGB, the Stasi. They were police forces and their main role in their governments, whether it was in Germany or, um, or Russia or um, uh, East Berlin, was to find out who was a potential threat to the government and to deal with them, either violently or through, um, quote unquote, the judicial system, which was they get scooped up, they get arrested, they get accused of being double agents or insurrectionists or spies or what have you, and then they get carted off to the gulag and you never see them again. Uh, then people start to see those 
police forces, agencies as essentially an occupying army, which is what they are. And the FBI doing this half-assed uh, Governor Whitmer plot, kidnapping plot, while at the same year this quote-unquote insurrection goes on and there's theories swirling around that there were FBI agents all over uh, the crowd on January 6th, that there were FBI informants all over the same crowd, and that the people who broke into the Capitol uh, it, in the initial wave were actually federal agents trying to entrap people to distract from the contested 2020 election. Well, those questions still exist three years later, and we don't have answers. And um, I'll take you out with this clip uh, that was... I mean, it's seared in my memory, but it was Senator Ted Cruz asking the FBI the same questions that I've asked today, and we still uh, aren't being given the answer. And going into 2024 elections, uh, the, the election of 2024, um, it, it's, it's just around the corner, and um, everybody uh, needs to be aware of what's going on in our government. Everybody needs to be aware of what's at stake in the next election because you don't get many times uh, to like you know right the ship. Once once the ship is listing over to a side, it just it's a matter of degrees and it capsizes and then you can't you're not going to be able to get it back uh, on its right side. And this is where the American uh, the, the 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 republic is. It's like. After 2020, we are listing hard to our port side. If we go over any further and things like what happened in 2020 and 2021 happen again, I believe it will capsize this ship. And I, and I don't want to be here when it happens, and I know you don't either. Um, so we'll just uh, we'll have to wait and see, and we'll have to stay frosty. But uh, if you enjoyed this video and got found it informative, give us a thumbs up. Uh, Give us a, a subscribe, uh, a subscription if you haven't. Share it with family and friends. And we'll see you back here next time. Till then, take care. I want to turn to the FBI. How many FBI agents or confidential informants actively participated in the events of January 6th? Sir, I'm sure you can appreciate that I can't go into the specifics of sources and methods. Uh, did any FBI agents FBI or agents confidential or informants confidential actively informants participate in the events of January 6th? Yes or no? Yes or no? Sir, I can't, I can't answer that. Did any FBI agents did or FBI confidential agents informants commit crimes of violence on January 6th? 6th? I can't answer that, sir. Did any FBI did agents any FBI or FBI informants actively encourage and incite Crimes of violence on January 6th. Sir, I can't answer that. Ms. Sadburn, Ms. Sadburn, who is Ray Epps? I'm aware of the individual, sir. Uh, I don't have the specific background to him. Well, there are a lot well, of people who are understandably very concerned, concerned, concerned about Mr. Epps. On the night of January 5th, 2021, Epps wandered around the crowd that had gathered. And there's video out there of him chanting, tomorrow, we need to get into the Capitol, into the Capitol. This was strange behavior, so strange that the crowd began chanting, fed, 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 fed. Ms. Sandburn, was Ray Epps a fed? Sir, I cannot answer that question.